Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another edition of the Democratic View. And this Democratic View is always about, a lot about issues that are affecting those of us who live in this great democracy. Uh, we like to call it that anyway. Um, and my name is Phyllis Italiano. And with me today is a very learned guy on, an era, on a whole subject that we haven't really touched on before. And his name is Izzy. Doroski. 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 Correct. Yes. So, Izzy, tell us about who you are and where you're from. Well, I'm a uh, lifelong resident of the township of Riverhead. And uh, I uh, got interested about energy sort of uh, from the street, uh, from the back door. And uh, I, I went to uh, college back in 1973. And uh, uh, that's when the oil embargo happened in September of 1973. And I never thought about energy once in my life. And then when that happened, I, it really had an impact on me because we had difficulty trying to get home. Uh, I was hit, getting a ride from one of my friends, and right. we had a real problem getting gasoline. Then I, I went to Cortland State. I got a biology degree. I took a lot of courses in physics, and I, I, got, a, I got a biology degree and geology. I learned about alternate energy, and I always thought it would be a good idea to, to get alternate energy in my house when I had the opportunity. And then that opportunity came in 1981, when my wife and I uh, uh, bought our house, and they had the solar tax credit available for solar hot water. My first solar system I put on my house was in 1981. It was a solar hot water system. And you just went and purchased that? Yes. Uh, I think at the time I was somewhere around $1,200, and, and I think it was a 40% uh, tax credit that came from the state and federal government, which lowered the price considerably. And the system worked fantastically. Uh, I would get hot water in the summertime, reaching sometimes up to 175 degree hot water. L luckily, you don't pull it because there's a mixing valve, so you can't pull 175 degree hot water. Now, of course, when the sun doesn't shine, then you're not going to produce much so hot water that way. But you have a backup system that will automatically kick on and provide the hot water for you. But that solar hot water system provides over 60% of my hot water for the year. And then your next step into the energy uh, field was? Okay, well, well uh, in my job, I, I uh, got a job in, uh, with the Suffolk County Department of Health Services in uh, 1980. And uh, in, in my career, I inspected many energy producing facilities. Uh, my job would be to uh, go out, uh, I was a, a health scientist, an environmental health scientist. Public health sanitarian was the exact term. And we would go out and inspect companies for air, water pollution, uh, chemical storage, emergency response. We worked with the police. And I inspected many uh, facilities of LIPA, or LOCO at the time, that produced electricity. And uh, I also inspected the, 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 uh, the LOCO uh, get cryogenic storage plant there in Holtzville, some of their step-up generating plants, the Northville Docks uh, petroleum storage terminal, so I learned a lot about energy that way. And uh, so I, I was always interested in the field of energy. And then, uh, and then later on, uh, in 2004, I uh, installed a solar photovoltaic system, my first solar electric system. And that's a five kilowatt grid connected system. And that means panels on your roof. That's correct. I have 30 panels on my roof. And I have uh, 16 panels on the south side of an L ranch and I have 14 panels on the east side. And uh, it produces generally over 70% of my electricity for my house. It's a wonderful working system. The, the only issue is, is that if the grid ever goes down, if, if LIPA goes down, then that will go down. So a year after that, I installed a small battery system, not totally isolated from the AC system. This is a mm -hmm. small DC system. And I put LED and xenon bulb lights throughout my whole house. And I put four additional solar panels on with two 180 amp batteries in a vented proper ba battery storage system. And that, that provides emergency power for lighting 
And for a DC powered fan, in case my power goes out in the winter, I can run my wood coal stove and blow, distribute the heat from that throughout my house with these DC powered fans. You know, I've got to just tell you a little story about something that happened to me. Uh, I was surged in Sandy. I don't know if you know, I'm sure you must know what that means because I say it to people and they don't mm -hmm. know what it means. It means that too much electricity came into my house uh, because a floating neutral mm -hmm. was not connected. As a result, I lost everything in my house, electrical, except my wow. stove, except my refrigerator, my washing machine and dryer combination, and my dishwasher. Everything else. So it burnt else. them out. Burned the surge, completely yeah. out. Wow, that's a And little... that was an unbelievable trauma. First of all, everybody thought they could fix the stove, a $3,000 electric stove. Uh, they thought they could fix the microwave. And of course, it wound up they couldn't fix e any of those things. They had to be replaced. I was going back and forth to PC Richards for the entire month of November. I, it, it happened to me on November, what was it, the 8th, and I mean, I, I, you know, and, and the November the 8th, and December the 1st my, my, was when I finally got my microwave hooked oh, up. Very and I was completely yeah. back to, I mean, I'm talking about my furnace was out, my hot water, everything was wow. out. Everything so, electrical was served. Everything electrical was, light wow. bulbs, you know, phones. Did, did, did they you compensate it. you for that? Well, they did after I get put up quite a battle, uh -huh. and I'm, Fortunately for them, I had a lot of strings to pull, and they, they did compensate me. Yeah, that's very and, rare. And I know. Yeah. To, to, to win against, uh, against that kind of a company is an amazing thing. But um, it was their fault, and I refused to, to make my insurance company pay for it. Right. So when we were kind of getting this big storm coming up, Miss Nemo, they call it, I was so panicked that I was going to get surged again and that I wouldn't have any, and now it's winter and now it's a storm and how do you get out, you know, to even go to a hotel or, or anywhere else that you might want to go, uh, that I was doing everything I could to get ready, the water, the bathtub, you know, all of the stuff that you do when you think you're going to lose power. Oh, I forgot to get the salt in the shed in case it's, you know, I want to put it on the steps. So I ran out to my shed. Now, mind you, that was a very wet, heavy storm. I walked up to my, uh, my ramp to my shed. My feet went out I from under me. I slipped. My head hit the metal rim of oh, where the goodness. doors are. I had a big bulb like that, two black eyes. And four weeks later, I developed vertigo, oh. which I am just getting rid of. So don't talk to me about what happens yeah. when the power goes out because well, I'm the, panicked on the power. That's, that's really a rare event, but it can happen. Yes. And it, part of my job, I used to inspect sewage treatment plants throughout Suffolk County. We have 190 wastewater treatment plants in Suffolk County. And lots of times, whenever this surges, they'll really disrupt the wastewater treatment plants. They're very sophisticated electrical systems. They actually have surge protectors, many of them, to protect them from that. Well, I bought the most expensive surge protectors for oh, you put one in. for my yeah. well. I put them put them in on you know the the ones for the uh, TVs and things like that you know so that I wouldn't uh, you know. But anyway, I will know what to do okay, next I time. I see individual one you put in. Individual. You could put a main one in for your house too. It's possible. Yes. But, but they're expensive. Yeah. Well, I will do but, anything yeah. <laughs> because I don't want that to happen again. Yeah. It was such a trauma. Such uh. a trauma. Uh, and the result was uh, the, you know, the ceiling hitting me in the, in the head when I get up every day. Oh, my goodness. So, uh, so. Um, Safety is always the most important. Yes, indeed, yeah. isn't it? Isn't it? So tell me a little bit more about, uh, about the effect of, of having this kind. You were talking before to me about what it takes to dry a load uh, of laundry. Yeah, most people are probably unaware of that just to dry a, a load of laundry in your electric dryer is about 4,000 watts. So my photovoltaic system uh, on the shortest day of the year, a beautiful sunny day, uh, uh, December 21st, the maximum electricity I would get would be 7,000 watts. Okay, so on that same day, I could dry a, a load of laundry that's 4,000 watts. 
So you could just see that for the, for the money, uh, you could probably put up a clothesline for something like under $50. <laughs> so it's your best bang for the buck. Yet it's hardly ever mentioned. Yes. So, so that's, that's a simple thing that everybody can do. And it's very important for them to, the first thing to do is, is cut back on their energy use, conserve. Put in put fluorescent bulbs, LED bulbs, wherever possible. I've just done all that, yes. Conserve, because most people, they just abuse energy. They just use too much. And, and they can cut back. Shut the TV off when you're not around. I know sometimes I'll leave it on for the cats are watching it. <laughs> um, there's so many things we can all do to cut down on energy use. And, and not only that, you're, you're reducing carbon dioxide emissions because those power plants have to burn natural gas or, or oil. And, and uh, so, so you're helping the environment that way. Well, I'm, I'm looking into uh, purchasing solar panels, which uh, over the long, I think over take about eight years, they will have paid for themselves. Yeah, uh, it's, I, I can just tell you my solar panels, when I put them in in 2004, the total cost is 30, was $39,000. But the, the LIPA instant rebate brought it down to $14,000. And then the state tax credit brought it down to $12,000. So, so that's what made it economically possible for me to do it. So basically, for the price of a used car, I got a solar system that provides over 70% of my electric needs. My last bill, my wife just got it in a few days ago, it was $12. And that was just... The Boy, would I like to pay like that, $12 a month every two months. That was just the maintenance charge. That, that's, so basically, we're store, right now, we're producing so much solar that we're storing it up, storing up credits, that by the time... July rolls around, then we'll get our first bill that's going to be somewhat higher, probably something like $48 or so. And then, because right now we're producing a surplus of electricity because the sun's higher and we're having nice weather. And uh, so, so we'll just bank that up. And then, and then, but eventually we'll use that up sometime around July or August. Well, you use air conditioning? We do some. We have two, two dehumidifiers in our basement, and we have an air conditioner for our master bedroom suite. Yeah, and, uh, but, but because it's grid-connected, our, our solar system, the, the, we have two separate ones, as I said before, but the grid-connected system uh, produces electricity, and then it, 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 it makes my meter basically go backwards. Okay? And it goes right into the power grid that everybody else can use. So that's how it works. The you know, I wanted to, th you know, it's very interesting you mentioned that because, uh, by the way, LIPA does not give the amount now that they gave to you. That's correct. Yeah, they, they, they are been lowering. reducing them. That's why if you want to do it. They've been very generous with it, too. Yeah, we have to you, give them some credit. You, but do it soon is the way I, the yeah. way I look. I, I, I suspect it's going to go, especially since we don't know what's going to happen with, with LIPA anyway. Uh, but also, I asked the gentleman who, is, who came to my house about this, uh, why does LIPA give you this credit? Uh, why are they interested in me getting solar panel? Because what happens is they're paying for such heavy prices to produce electricity. So if you're going to produce electricity for them, you're really helping them. That's correct. So yes. that, that people have to recognize that the more the panels are up, the lower actually prices will, will actually not the prices won't go down. Right now, the prices will go up for people around me yes. because I will be off the grid, but yeah. they will be getting my electricity. But eventually, if more people did it and really became the thing to do, it would eventually make, um, I, I would suspect, make the cost of electricity go down. Definitely. And, and the price of the panels, the technology is getting better. And, and, and uh, the price is actually coming down somewhat. Yes, the price, my price is not as high as your price. Yes. And, yes, and also, I wanted to tell you that one thing you said is it was like, it was taking two cars equal to the carbon dioxide of taking two cars off the road for two years. Yes. And since I drive a Prius. <laughs> yeah, you know, I have one too. I, I'm very anxious to see, to yeah. do that sort of thing. So it is something that we all have to be aware of, that we have to help. And part of that reason is, as I was mentioning to you before, uh, when I was uh, teaching in um, private school, I taught a humanities course, and I taught Islam. And uh, I know that those countries were sitting on, you know, massive amounts of oil. That's right. And I remember a gentleman coming who was giving us a talk about Afghanistan. 
and did say to us, you know, pretty soon that oil will run out. That's correct. And uh, it kind of brings us to the topic of peak oil. If you That's what I that. want to hear about, peak sure. oil. Well, I, I, I study a lot of things on my own. And back around 2002 to 2004, I started to see the price of oil rise like everybody. Yes. It went, I think the price of oil was somewhere around $12 a barrel in 1999. And then it, from there, it just started to go up. And, and I was like, what is going on? So yeah. I, I got introduced to the concept of peak oil. And I'll tell you about what it is in, in the audience here. Peak oil is a term that refers to the fact that oil production in the world will reach a maximum point of production and then go into an irre irreversible decline eventually. And that decline can go a number of ways. It doesn't mean we're going to run out of oil. It just means that the flow rate has to deal with the flow rate of oil in the world. Right now, roughly, the world produces somewhere in the around 88 million barrels per day of oil. The United States, just guess how much oil the United States uses. The world <laughs> Probably 88. <laughs> no, no. The, the world produces somewhere around 88 million barrels per day. The United States uses somewhere around 17 and a half to 18 and a half million barrels per day of that. Okay? That's, That's a million lot. barrels per day. That's a lot Okay? Of oil. Now, now, the United States, actually, we've come down because of the economic recessions, series of recessions, I guess is the way you can call it, for the last five years, since 2008, we had that stock market crash. And, uh, but, but the rest of the world is going up in oil consumption. Yes, so, yes. So that, that's what the term peak oil is. And it's a real problem for us. All right? Now, now there's some scientists and geophysicists who, who uh, debate this issue and don't agree with this. They say, no, there's the shale oil resources. There's other vast resources out there that we can get. But there's an organization known as ASPO, Association for Peak Oil Study. And they, they study this. And, and, and uh, they, they basically right now are saying that, that oil production for the last five years, if you just look at oil production, it, it has actually it has not increased for the last five years, since, two, since 2005, actually, the last seven to eight years. And we're, the only reason why, why the amount of available Liquid fuels has gone up because of biofuels and natural gas liquids, and, and that's the only reason. So, so we're already seeing the effects of, of a problem from it. Now, and aren't those more difficult to, to produce? Yes. Aren't they more diff complicated and probably more expensive, I would imagine? Absolutely. You, you have to remember that it all comes down to a scientific uh, factor known as energy return on energy invested. Back in the 1930s, when they put in a well in East Texas or West Texas or in Oklahoma, like Spindle Top, they, they put in these wells and they, and they, first of all, lots of times when they put in a well, they're, they're not successful, not going to find oil. So they have to write that into their costs. But when they did find a well, when they, when they had a high, a high pressurized gusher, basically they put in one unit of energy, they got 100 out. Okay, that's the way it is. Nowadays, with like the shale oil that they're getting from the Bakken area, or the tar sands, those, the energy return on energy invested is very much lower. It's somewhere around four to maybe eight. So, so there's oil resources available, but the amount of energy to get it out is increasing. Yes. All right, so it's the, the, what the important thing for people to understand is that the energy return on energy invested keeps decreasing. That's the problem we're facing here. There's a book, now there's a scientist, there's a, actually a geophysicist that first studied this, an American geophysicist who worked for Shell Oil. His name was Dr. M. King Hubbard. And in, in the 1930s, he was noticing that the United States had a peak in discovery. And the, and the techniques for finding oil kept getting better and better, but we kept finding less. So he realized that the United States would eventually peak in production. And he was correct. His name was Dr. M. King Hubbard. And, and he said that, th that the United States will peak in 1970. And we did peak in 1970. The United States peaked in oil production at around 10.2 million barrels per day in 1970. And since that time, we went down to about 4.8 million barrels per day. Okay. And now recently, we've bumped back up about 10% or so with the uh, shale oil that we've been using. But uh, the problem with the shale oil is it has very low energy return on energy invested. So that's, and, and those shale wells, when they put in a shale well, they, they deplete by 80% in three years. And then, then the environmentalists also bring up the issues as far as the fracking fluids. You probably heard about the fracking fluids oh, of course debate. I have.
Well, that's, you can imagine that every time they put in one of those fracking wells, now keep in mind when they do a, a fracking well, they have, to, uh, they have to put in a well, they go down um, several thousands of feet deep, and then they have to go horizontally several thousand feet deep, and then they have to add these fracking fluids, which are like hydraulic fracking fluids, and they actually pressurize them under intense pressure. That's actually dangerous. And then they actually crack the rock, and that's how they get the oil to come out. And then, but those wells, they deplete by 80% in three years. So they have to put another one in. Now, those fracking fluids all have to be hauled in, and then the waste fracking fluids have to be hauled out. Uses a lot of energy, doesn't it? You bet. Yeah. So that, that's the issue there. So, so as, a, as Kenneth DeFaze, who's a colleague of Dr. M. King Hubbard, summed it up in his book, uh, Hubbard's Peak, he basically succinctly put it this way, that uh, we've used a trillion barrels of oil so far in the world. There's either one or two trillion left. But the issue is, is that that next one or two trillion is very low energy return on energy invested. Not like the first trillion barrels. So I hope I'm uh, getting my point across here, is, is that, that we're, having, we're gonna have a problem. We're gonna have a problem as far as oil. Now, now also, and another thing is that if you, if you put up a solar panel, you need oil to produce that, all right? People say, well, what do you mean? Well, when you go to build a solar panel, you have to, the miners have to mine high-grade siliconite. They use diesel tractors, okay? They transport it to the refining factory on roads made from asphalt. They use electricity that have wires that are coated in plastic, all made from oil. So it's these oils integrated into our lives, and we just don't realize it. I, I know. I mean, every time, of course, I, I recycle every bit of plastic I possibly can. But the thought of what we use in just plastic alone That's correct. is amazing. Yeah. Just think of all those plastic bags that you get at the supermarket to put your vegetables. Even though we have this now in East Hampton where you have to have I, paper, you know, you still... You're going to put those vegetables in it, those In my bags. job, I used to go out to uh, gasoline stations, transmission shops, and often they would dispose of their waste chemicals in their storm drains or on the ground. And I, I, we, we used to make them clean it up. Not everybody does that. There's many re environmentally responsible individuals that do, but occasionally you're going to find this. And I always had a, a, a negative feeling towards oil because of that. But when I started to study, when I started to study the energy picture in oil, oil was actually a miracle, and we've been abusing it. That's the problem. Think, think of it this way. One barrel of oil is 42 gallons. One barrel of oil contains the energy of 12 men working for a year. Okay? It's, it's 25,000 man hours. One, 42 gallons. People go, what are you talking about? Well, go mow your lawn with a push reel, or go get a powered lawnmower that you ride on. Okay, wow. how many guys would it take to push a tractor trailer up a large hill? Meanwhile, you can get that tractor trailer up that hill using about this much diesel fuel in a cup. You understand that concept? People don't realize how much energy is, is in oil. But oil is not just energy, it's also a vast resource used for making plastics, uh, pharmaceuticals, aspirins actually made from it directly, they synthesize it. Um, what, and what they don't know, what a lot of people don't know is what oil really comes from. And That's why right. there is no more yeah. and we, will be no we, more at some point because it's made billions of years ago. That's right, millions of years ago. It takes millions, millions. and millions, of, hundreds of millions of years ago. What happened is most oil came from ancient plankton in the yes. sea. It's it just uh, over years, actually oil is a, is a derivative of solar energy because the, the microorganisms that made oil possible got their energy from the sun. Okay, think of the ancient seas. You had all these, uh, all these sea animals living in there, most, but mostly plankton, vegetative. And they, they absorbed all their energy from the sun, and when they died, their bodies went to the bottom of the sea. And over millions and millions and millions of years, this rich organic matter down there, covered over in sand and silt, buried thousands of feet deep and hot, hotter than a coffee pot. All right, that's what... And that's, under pressure. Under pressure, exactly, and that's how oil formed. I Most know. people aren't aware of that. No, I know they are. And here we are. We use it up so fast, and we abuse it. So we, we, we've, we've inherited this. So besides the fact, that, but even if I put these solar panels on, I mean, that's alleviating some of the problem. Uh, but so, what are we going to do? We have to do everything. We, we have a real problem, and, and it's not recognized. And, and in my opinion, our government's well aware of this. And uh, there's, there's many in the field, uh, uh, like Dr. Robert Hirsch, who came from many oil companies, 
And uh, he, he's also participated with ASPO, Association of Peak Oil Study. And uh, we're fighting the, the large old fields that are in decline, like the Garwar field in Saudi Arabia, the Bergen field in Kuwait. These old fields, these tremendously productive fields producing for decades are dying. And they're, they're trying to make it up with these smaller shale plays, the deep sea plays, like the Macondo well that leaked there in the Gulf of Mexico. And, and we're fighting it. So we're going to have to do everything. We're going to have to conserve. There, there is no new, like uh, Matt, the late Matt Simmons said, there is no new oil field like conservation. All right? Con conservation is so important for us. All right? And then we're going to have to develop all of our resources together together to, to fight this. And we just, we just can't do the war route that you brought up previously in your other interview of, of getting our troops over there you know, to those... We always seem to be around the oil fields. You ever notice that? <laughs> I that that we're always fighting around the oil fields. I know that. Isn't that just a coincidence? I know that. And know. That, that was one of the so, things that that gentleman so. who said, he said, you know, pretty soon when they run out of oil, nobody's going to care about the Middle East. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we're going to say, do what you want to favor. And, and we have enough. big problems. Yeah. We're gonna, so the, what are we going to do? We're going to have to do everything. And number one thing is educate everybody. And I'm a, I'm a free market person. I, but the free market works on free information. All right? And we're not getting the free information here, no. right? No. See, oil is priced like it's going to last forever, all right? And it's not. And it's not going to end, but the price is going to get, the cheap oil has gone. Now we're in the expensive oil, the tar sands, the shale oil. That's where we are now. And it's, it's an issue. God. Another cheery, bright show. Well, no, it, it's it's uh, it's uh, no, you know. but you're right. We have to learn about it. We have yeah. to learn about what we need to do. I mean, we're not even talking about water, right. and what's going to happen with portable water uh -huh. in the future, which will be the new oil. It'll be so valuable. You can't have life without water. No. All right, and the ish problem is, is you can't you can't have water without oil. You got to pump the water. All right, so you need you need an energy source to get the water moved around. Right, you got to make pipes. There comes the oil. So it's all integrated together. I say, everybody, go out and get your solar panels right now. Yeah, yeah. It, it, Let, it's, let's it's, start it's, on that. It's one of the many, many things people can do. The first thing, conserve energy in your house. That's very, very important. Conserve so. energy in your house. Stop driving those big cars. Absolutely. Get those Absolutely. Priuses out there. Uh, I've got a hybrid. I get those hybrids uh, it, out. It's great. Fantastic. <laughs>